All right, welcome back forensic students. Previously, in a previous lesson, I introduced forensic anthropology, and we discussed the fact that when skeletal remains are found, investigators treat the area as an active crime scene. So they're gonna secure the scene, they're gonna process the scene, but they might call in the help of a forensic specialist, specifically a forensic anthropologist, to assist in determining the identity of the person whose skeletal remains were found. So we walk through just an overview of forensic anthropology, and I told you that in the next few lessons, we would take a deep dive into some specific parts of the skeleton that might provide clues to investigators. So what we're looking at today is the human skull specifically, and what the skull can tell anthropologists about a person and how they might have lived, and uh, even better, how they might have died. All right, so as we've learned, bones can reveal possible information about a person's biological profile. Now, by biological profile, we mean their age, their sex, their ancestry, uh, and possibly their height. So the human skull or cranium specifically can give clues to uh, age, sex, and ancestry. So not height, but three out of the four. Um, so those are the clues that we're going to go through and discuss today. We're going to talk about how anthropologists can use these clues to determine um, possible sex, ancestry, and age of the deceased. Now, the skull can often provide other clues as to a person's cause of death. Uh, so if you'll look at the picture on the screen, this fracture to the upper eye orbital is indicative of a gunshot wound. So not only would this skull give anthropologists clues as to um, maybe how a person lived or whether they're male or female or uh, their ancestry, but also perhaps their cause of death. Now, it's important to note that these are uh, only clues. So this is not set in stone. It just provides clues. Uh, but the goal is to determine ultimately who died, how they died, and then how long ago it was um, since their death. All right now, before we go any further, um, here's what I need you to do. I want you to get familiar with the major bones of the human skull and the anatomy of the human skull. If you're in my class, you have this worksheet, so I want you to pause the video and take the time to familiarize yourself with the different regions of the skull. The reason why you're going to want to do this is as we have our discussion today in our lesson, we are going to talk about some of these terms, and I want you to be familiar with where they are on the human skull. So pause the video now, familiarize yourself with the skull, and then come back and we'll finish our discussion. Now, our forensic anthropologist can read the evidence in a skeleton very similar to the way we can read a book. So the techniques that they use to answer questions in criminal cases can be applied to skeletons of any age, uh, modern or ancient. And the stages of growth and development in bones and teeth provide information or clues about whether remains represent a child or an adult. And the shape of pelvic bones can provide evidence for the sex of a person. Um, anthropologists can look for abnormal changes in the shape or size and density of the bone, and that can indicate things like disease or trauma. Uh, bones marked by injury, like we saw earlier in the picture, um, such as unhealed fractures or bullet holes or cuts, that can help reveal cause of death. And these trained anthropologists are going to help to identify skeletal clues of ancestry. Um, so we're going to look at all those different realms today, um, and we're going to talk about how anthrop anthropologists specifically are able to do this. Um, now, this needs to go in your notes. So there are, we're going to start with determining sex based on the human skull. So here we have some characteristics of the male skull and the female skull. So I want you to pause the video and write these down and then come back and we'll finish our discussion. All right, now there are quite a few differences between the male skull and the female skull. Um, so for example, the mandible 
And if you, again, if you're unfamiliar with what we mean by mandible or where it is, or nuchal crest or where it is on the skull, again, go back to this image or do a quick Google search of the, the major bones in the human skull and familiarize yourself with these regions. It'll make it much easier as we move through the lesson. All right, so going back to the mandible, in a male, it's going to be more U-shaped, whereas in a female, it's going to be more V-shaped. Eye orbitals are also different in male versus female skull. So the eye orbital is going to be more square for the male, more round for the female. And then there's some other differences that we're going to go through and discuss um, throughout the lesson. Now, I do want to show you an example. Let's talk about the brow ridges for a second. Um, so above the eye orbital, you have the brow ridges, and they are very underdeveloped um, or gracile for a female. They, they look very petite versus the brow bones of a male skull. They're going to be more developed brow ridges. Um, and if you'll reach back behind your head and touch the area where your neck muscles join with your skull, this area is called the nuchal crest. And in females, uh, this area can be very smooth. In males, this area is going to be rough or bumpy. And it's hard to tell if you have a lot of muscle back there behind your head. Um, but you can see on the skull the difference. So you can see for the female skull, it's going to be relatively smooth. Versus the male skull, it's going to be more rough and bumpy. This is also some information that you need to make sure that you get into your notes. So the skull can also be used to determine approximate age, um, not a guaranteed age, not, a, um, not an exact age, it's an approximation. Uh, so investigators or anthropologists use these clues to help determine approximate age. Um, and by clues, we mean the cranial sutures. So the cranial sutures um, our joints, they're made of strong fibrous tissues. They hold the skull together. Now, during infancy, they remain flexible, and that allows the brain to grow. But over time, they fuse together. So by about age 30, the suture at the back of the skull closes. By about age 32, the suture running across the top of the skull, the one going back to front, closes. You can see that in the image here. And then by about age 50, the suture running side to side over the top of the skull um, near the front closes. So those clues are important to determining approximate age of a person whose skeletal remains are found. Here's an example of a comparison between a 20-year-old skull. So the skull on the left is a 20-year-old skull, and then the skull on the right is from a 70-year-old person. Um, and you can see the difference in the cranial sutures there. So the 70-year-old person, um, those sutures have fused. And then you can see the sutures um, are very distinct on the, on the skull of a 20-year-old. All right, so the skull can also be used to get an idea of ancestry. So features inherited from generation to generation are expressed in the morphology or the shape of the human skull. And many of these characteristics have evolved in response to environmental factors. But analysis of the features of the skull can give us an indication of the ancestry of an individual. Now, by ancestry, what we mean is specifically um, we're referring to a person's biological background. So skulls can be classified according to three biological backgrounds. We have European, African, and Asian. Um, and again, we're referring to the area where a person's evolutionary background is from. So you can see in the image here, the differences in the features of the skull um, from European dis, um, ancestry, Asian, and African ancestry. And then here you have some written characteristics, um, ancestral differences between the skull. And if you need to pause the video to write this down, you can do that. All right, let's talk about teeth just a second. So teeth are often found attached to the mandible of a skull and teeth can provide quite a few clues for anthropologists. Uh, for example, diet, 
hygiene and age. Um, those are all often determined uh, by observing teeth. We know that teeth develop throughout a person's life and forensic anthropologists are going to use their knowledge of growth and development to get an estimation of a person's age within one to two years. It's not an exact age, but they can get pretty close. So you can see from this chart the development of teeth and anthropologists are able to use um, growth and development information from known individuals to compare those to unknown skeletal remains to get an idea of uh, hygiene and age. Now, also, the skull can give clues as to cause of death. So we know the skull can give information about age, possible hygiene, um, ancestry, sex, but it can also help us to determine um, cause of death. So scientists recovered this particular skull from the English colony at Jamestown. And this skull dates back to 1609. Uh, and if you'll remember from history, this is during the time when settlers of the first English colony in America were basically starving. So this skull shows markings that indicate that this person who anthropologists later discovered was a young female was killed and eaten. So these marks that you see, these four um, chop marks, they are chops that were made to her skull in an attempt to get her brain. So anthropologists were able to determine that um, this young lady was dead and then the chops were made to her skull. So that is an indication that they were trying to get to her brain so that they could eat it. Um, so it had been speculated that um, the colonists at Jamestown during this time of starvation, they resorted to cannibalism. And this is proof, um, proof that that happened, which is very interesting. So if you have some time, I highly recommend you um, do some research over uh, the English colony at Jamestown. All right, so tools and technology. Uh, forensic anthropologists are able to tell a lot about skeletal remains by using what we call gross observation. So that's what they can see with their eyes. But they'll often use tools that allow them to see deeper into the bone. And that's what you see here on the screen. So one of the tools that anthropologists use is a microscopy. Um, which uses a scanning electro electron microscope to magnify bones and teeth. So you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, that's a magnified uh, bone using electron microscope imaging. Now, another tool that anthropologists use are x-rays. And in this case, they're, when they use x-rays, they're not looking at the surface. They're looking internally into the bone. So this can give a better insight into dental development and bone density, both help determine age um, or even health. Now, if you look at this middle picture, not only can uh, x-ray be used to determine bone density and development, but here um, we're able to see that there is a bullet lodged in the skull. Um, and so that can help give a clue as to cause of death. Now, another technology that's used is CT or CAT scanning. Um, this allows scientists to look inside burial containers, even like a coffin. Um, so you can see that here. So they're allowed, um, they're able to sort of peel away an exterior to really get inside of a container or a vessel that a body might be inside to get an idea of um, the bones or the skeleton um, inside that container, which is very interesting. Now, a newer technology is uh, chemical analysis. So it's basically looking at the chemistry of bones. Now, this allows for retrieval of DNA um, and can give clues like diet. And let's talk about facial reconstruction to end the lesson today. So facial reconstruction can determine what a person looked like when they were alive. So anthropologists are able to take the skull, doesn't even have to be a whole skull, um, and they're able to 
uh, reconstruct the face to determine what a person may have looked like when they were living. So because scientists know how deep our tissues are on our faces, uh, they can use tissue depths to put markers and rebuild a person's likeness uh, just with a skull. So this is dependent upon uh, sex, ancestry, and age, but can aid in developing a replica, like you see here, of an unidentified skull. Now earlier I showed you the picture of the skull from the victim at Jamestown. They were able to use facial reconstruction. So you can see here in the picture um, the, the skeletal remains that were found. You can see some teeth in the picture. You can see some parts of the skull. They were able to reconstruct that skull well enough that they were able to use facial reconstruction to get a mock-up of what this young lady looked like uh, prior to her death. Just so interesting. Um, if you want to research this further, if you'll go to the National Museum of Natural History, there's a video there called Bringing Jane to Life. It is very interesting how they were able to take bones and then develop this mock image of Jane. Uh, so I've got a web address here if you want to do some more digging into this case. Highly, highly recommend you do that before you, you um, watch the next video where we're going to be talking about the pellet bone.